Hello and welcome to this video about how to explore the North Atlantic in your own aircraft. Think about it like a how-to guide. The how-to guide that we would have found useful when preparing for our trip. And our trip was crossing the Atlantic, both going east and west, in a general aviation aircraft. This is the trip uh, that we planned and then flew from the Chicago area to Goose Bay, across the Atlantic, um, all the way to Austria, then up to Norway, all the way up to Spitsbergen and Svalbard, and then back home. First, a disclaimer, I'm not an instructor. I am a leisure pilot, uh, commercially rated, but uh, this is not my day job. Uh, please do your own research for your own mission. I will cover our mission, our dream, the preparation for both pilots and aircraft, the journey east, the journey north, and then flying back home to the States, south and west. Finishing up with a few highlights and useful links and references. And let me already say here, a big thanks to all the people who helped us prepare and execute this fabulous trip. So let's talk with the mission, with our dream. What we really wanted to do is cross the Atlantic in both directions, flying the World War II Blue Spruce routes, a truly a bucket list trip. Fly to our birthplace, Innsbruck, Austria, where our aviation journey started some 45 years ago, so we've been around for a while. Um, visit family and friends in Austria, gliding in the Alps with a modern Champert Arcus M self-launching glider. Then explore northern Norway, including Alisund, the Geiranger Fjord, and the truly enchanted Lofoten Islands. Fly to the northernmost destination, Svalbard, often referred to as Spitsbergen. Spitsbergen is the biggest island in overall Svalbard territory, which is a territory that's autonomous but administered by Norway, according to Norwegian law. It is at latitude 78 north, just 700 nautical miles south of the North Pole. As a reference, Barrow, Alaska, now called Utjaqvik, is at 71 degrees north, so significantly further north than Barrow, Alaska. We plan to explore Greenland around Narsarsarak on the way back. In the end, we got a chance to do it both ways. Uh, do it, of course, professionally, safely, IFR flight plans on every trip um, and learn new skills preparing for the trip and of course along the way. The platform, uh, trust the uh, Turbo Commander 1000 or model number 695A. Some of the specs, it cruises easily at 285 knots at flight level 280. You can push it to 300 knots, but 285 is a comfortable uh, space and the practical range is about 1700 nautical miles with an endurance exceeding six hours so uh, it has long legs we ended up traveling well in excess of 10,500 miles and the flight time around 35 to 40 hours and last but not least enjoy the journey with family uh, that joined us for parts of the trip so let's talk about preparation of the pilots I found no single source that fit our particular mission. It's almost like you have to piece it together like a puzzle and I just kept digging and kept learning. One book that kind of uh, whets your appetite and that I can recommend, Nine Lives Over the North Atlantic by Kerry McCauley, uh, a long time and highly experienced ferry pilot. Uh, it might scare you a little bit, but uh, then you'll know all the things not to do. Um, I was also hugely inspired by Robert De Laurentiis. I'm sure some of you have heard of him. He's also referred to as the Zen pilot, uh, the handle of flying through life. He took a turbo commander to both the South Pole and the North Pole and uh, reported about his journey. The AOPA website is a great start. They have a section about uh, crossing the North Atlantic uh, with all, not all, but a lot of the relevant information. Then the Bible uh, of North Atlantic travel is uh, truly a big document, the ICAO issues, the North Atlantic operations, an air ma airspace manual. Uh, for general aviation, especially chapter 17 is relevant, which is flight below the high level airspace. 
The high level airspace starts at 290 and that's where the daily tracks are uh, issued um, for the airliners going east and west and we operated obviously below that uh, 290. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube um, about North Atlantic crossing, but it's usually an adventure report and skips the kind of the important details that some of which I will try to cover. I want to thank Steve Thorne from Flight Shops who did a couple of um, segments on crossing the Atlantic, then Mickey Lang on Diamond. Um, there was a number of uh, videos about um, series being delivered uh, across the Atlantic both ways. So there's a lot of information there, but none of it is comprehensive or for sure not complete. In the end, I ended up uh, taking King School's online courses. Uh, they have a uh, international flight operations deluxe get it all kit. Um, it's six courses that you can complete online and generate your logbook entry after doing some online tests. And it certainly gave me all the information I needed or at least uh, additional questions I needed to track down. Since this is our first trip across the pond, we used Air Journey concierge service. Uh, I can highly recommend it. It's not the cheapest service, but it's very comprehensive and they have all the knowledge. For example, uh, they put us up with a fuel card from World Fuel Service, pre-arranged all the fuel releases. Uh, it makes life so much simpler. You don't have to call the FBO. Do we have fuel? What do you, uh, when can I come? What payment do you, you just show up, the truck shows up and um, a month later it gets debited from your account. For the European flight planning, um, of course, ForeFlight works worldwide, but especially some of the more special routing, I recommend autorouter.aero. Uh, especially also they have a very great feature, it's free, uh, called Gromit Weather. It gives you kind of a vertical cross-section of your flight from start to finish, depicting freezing levels, turbulence, cloud layers, um, you have to realize that once you leave the US, you don't have any weather on your foreflight or on your aircraft. And uh, having a, a visual depiction of what weather you can expect is very, very valuable. <clears throat> on the US side, the NOAA model works well. Once you uh, start with Greenland, I would recommend using the European weather model. It's in Gromit uh, described as DWD model for the German weather service. Um, for rough mapping, the globalcirclemap.com app is nice. Some of the visuals you see in this presentation were generated with that. And then um, they recommend that you use Chappies and North Atlantic plotting charts and plotting tools. They're inexpensive, um, 25 bucks or so, but to be honest, I never used them. You need to get liability insurance, which is about 10 times the level of what you need in the US. Um, we got it for a month and it was relatively inexpensive. Um, the insurance carrier is used to that. And then all the documents you need to compile, all the usual documents. And the one that you usually don't need in the US is of course radio license for yourself and for the aircraft. But on the FCC website, you can get that quite easily. Now let's talk about the aircraft. You want to make sure that all your maintenance is up to date and you double and triple check and do several shakedown trips. As they say, and I can confirm, the most dangerous flight is the one when you get the aircraft back for maintenance. I had several things happen. For example, a pressurization hose pops off or some settings are wrong in the avionics or some part wasn't installed right. So make sure you fly at least 20, 30 hours before you cross the pond. I chose to install an HF radio. Technically, it's not required, but if you have it, it makes things smoother. Gander can be quite onerous if uh, you tell them you don't have an HF radio. Um, again, once you leave the US, ADS-B, ground-based ADS-B doesn't exist. It's only satellite-based, so ADS-B ground-based often is referred to as UAT or Uniform Alpha Tango, different frequency from the space-based, which is 1090. And uh, you need what's called diversity transponders who can handle both the ground-based and the space-based ADS-B. You may be aware Canada is also requiring it now. We chose also to get the Sentry Plus uh, with the FLARM option, which uh, shows you gliders since we were 
operating in areas where there's glider activity. Uh, on the other hand, once you leave the US, you get no ADSB information from the sentry. Of course, you have a backup uh, AHARS, uh, so it's certainly not a requirement. You need the database subscription, the worldwide database subscription, which doubles your cost both for your flight deck and for your iPads. Aircraft documentation is a big one. Uh, you need a letter of authorization for all US-based uh, or registered aircraft that uh, attest that you have the navigation performance to fly on European airways and uh, fly European RNAV LPV, often referred to as RNP approaches. It's a technicality uh, because all your modern Garmin stuff does have uh, that performance, but in the end we ended up with two binders. Um, we were referred to by Air Journeys to a service called Jet RVSM, and they were extremely helpful. And while we were at it, we also cleaned up some of the other um, uh, dry lease uh, agreements for the aircraft that made us com completely compliant with all the requirements. Uh, of course, my objective, our objective was to maximize safety margin. We may have gone overboard, but uh, as the movie line says, it's my job to worry when there's nothing to worry about. So we went with two pilots um, and practiced our cockpit resource management, handheld radios. As you see from the flight deck, we have dual Garmin GTN navigators, dual Garmin uh, PFDs, um, dual transponders. And uh, I come back to that, you need to make sure your radios are set for the 8.33 kilohertz frequency spacing that we usually don't use in the US. Um, in the US, we fly all day long with the 25 kilohertz spacing. Um, I chose to have uh, portable supp supplemental oxygen. So you may wonder why the Turbo Commander is a pressurized aircraft. You already have backup oxygen in the aircraft, even uh, the mask for the passengers have come down. But my thinking was, um, if I need to descend because of a depressurization, uh, my range is, uh, uh, collapses. Any turbine aircraft, if you have to go down to 10,000 feet, your range uh, shrinks tremendously. So I wanted to at least have the option to stay at altitude and had supplemental oxygen uh, on board. Of course, we didn't use it. Um, it's certainly overkill, but that's what we did. Then a sat phone is handy. Uh, I have an AirTex Plus unit installed. In the end, I had some um, compatibility issues, um, user error, but um, usually that AirTex Plus unit uh, works very well. Handheld radius I mentioned, and then um, a Honeywell Aerowave in-flight internet system um, was the plan. Uh, I'm still waiting for it. Uh, lead times are ridiculous. Um, it's about still the most economical way to get in-flight internet. But I suspect in a couple of years from now, uh, you will be have cheaper options out there. Then, of course, survival equipment, uh, the life raft, the immersion suits, survival packs, life vest, flares, um, your personal locator be beacon and the Garmin spot. And again, you don't for turbine aircraft, you don't need the immersion suits or need, don't need to wear them. In all transparency, we wore them on the first leg and then put them behind us uh, between 280 and the water. There's a lot of time to put them on. Uh, you need a bathroom solution. The commander had, does have a laugh, but if you got a 250-pound pilot moving from the front to the back, the trim uh, changes, the autopilot kicks out. It's a lot easier just to have a pilot John handy. And then uh, we tried to document the journey uh, with GoPros. Took lots of pictures, recorded ATC, but editing those videos is a lot of work. That will come later. Uh, we took a lot of shorts of uh, the approach and landing to the different airports, and you can find them on our channel. And the edited videos will come probably by Christmas. Now let's get into it. Flying East. Uh, first, of course, you need to uh, file an EAPIS uh, to, before you leave the US. Uh, before landing in Canada, in Canada, you need to call uh, Campus between 2 and 48 hours in advance. We overnighted in Goose Bay, and uh, one thing immediately hits you once you leave the U.S. The moment they hand you over from Toronto to uh, Montreal or Montreal, 
uh, you will hear a lot of different accents and different languages on the radio, especially Canada. There's a lot of French on the radio or Canadian French. So you can keep speaking English. They will speak English with you, but don't expect to understand what the other people are doing. Uh, then um, I was fretting how I got the oceanic clearance, but in practice, it's quite easy. You take off from Goose Bay, they hand you over eventually to Gander and they give you your oceanic clearance including they assign you their HF frequencies. Now, uh, once you leave the coast, there's no more radar coverage. So how did it attract you? It's quite simple, time and speed. So then on the top of that, you need to re uh, report your position every 10 degrees of latitude. There's a special phraseology that you learn. It's very simple. Uh, you report when you uh, um, Cross the fix, the altitude, the time, when you expect to cross the next fix, and what is the fix after that. So it's not rocket science, but again, it's something you need to learn. Um, we were actually planning uh, to go straight from Goose Bay to Reykjavik. No problem with the commander under normal circumstances. We actually had nice tailwinds forecasted, but again, once you're over the ocean, forecasts are not worth uh, what they are in the continental US. We ended up having strong headwinds and after two and a half hours of strong headwinds, we decided to cut the trip short and head, land in our Sarsarak. Thankfully, they had beautiful weather, uh, very strong uh, wind on the nose. Usually you uh, take off downhill in our Sarsarak, but we had 20 plus knots in the other direction. So we took off uphill and no problem for the Turbo Commander. It was a great experience. One thing I wanted to point out, it's the heaviest turbulence I ever encountered as we were turning around and heading back west, uh, descending over Greenland. All of a sudden, it was like a sledgehammer hit the plane and 200 knots, that's uh, quite something. So we uh, immediately reduced speed. And then we had this really surreal experience uh, where we de uh, descended over a cloud layer and all of a sudden the cloud layer uh, ended up being glaciers. So never seen anything like it. Uh, we overnighted in Reykjavik. Um, Reykjavik already gives you the ocean oceanic clearance as part of the uh, IFR clearance you get before takeoff. Important, you need to switch your altimeter and in the Garmin there's a way to do that from inches to hectopascal or millibars because all the altimeter settings as of Reykjavik are in hectopascal. Nuke or Greenland still gives you both settings, but as of Reykjavik, you're in European territory. Also remember to switch to the 8.33 uh, kilohertz frequency spacing. Um, we found out, not the hard way, but as we were going, getting closer to Wick Scotland, uh, we saw all these frequencies popping up on the approaches on the ADISs and we figured we couldn't dial them in, so thankfully I found the setting to change the spacing on the Garmin box. Wick is a really special place built in World War II. It's a very popular spot uh, for Atlantic crossings, both east and west. Uh, truly wonderful people, great service. Um, I couldn't say uh, enough about um, how well that place is run and how customer friendly they are, including off hours. You can rent uh, your emergency equipment there if you don't have it uh, and drop it back off. So just a special place. Then we started to be confronted with Europe. The first was getting a, an SMS and the four flight message that uh, our slot was delayed by an hour and 15. And if you don't have your slot, you can't take off. It gets updated regularly in the end. It ended up only being one hour and no big deal, but uh, it's different than it is in the US. Uh, finally, we arrived in Innsbruck under glorious weather, so it was a great, great trip flying east. A few visuals. This is what I mentioned, descending over Greenland. So first, looks like you're descending over clouds, uh, heading west um, towards the fjords on the west side. And all of a sudden, you realize those are no longer clouds. You're descending into a glacier. So uh, quite an interesting experience. A few more visuals of Narsarsarak, uh, the runway is right there as we set up for the approach. Stunning, stunning landscapes. And uh, here we are setting up for the approach course. 
the runway is here and it actually says on the approach plate that the glide slope intersects with terrain so don't ride it all the way down uh, obviously not an issue when you're visual and just stunning scenery with icebergs on final here you see the commander in innsbruck uh, it was truly special for us we grew up soaring along these ridges um, many many years ago and uh, the scenery and panorama in Innsbruck and seeing our aircraft there is just uh, very rewarding. Give you a taste of soaring uh, along these ridges. Um, it's, a, it's a special uh, way of flying and uh, certainly that's how we started flying. Now let's talk about flying north. So um, again Euro control assigns you takeoff slots uh, usually confer starting confirmed in a couple hours before your uh, filed uh, takeoff time. Uh, and unlike the US, you cannot just start your engines. You need to call for a startup clearance for your engines. So you, uh, you can call 15 minutes ahead of your designated takeoff slot for your IFR clearance and for your startup clearance for your engines. The flight plan can be look very daunting if you in the US you, you can fly across the country and have one line in your four flight flight plan box well in Europe for a much shorter trip you will have six or seven lines with a never-ending sequence of fixes and airways but it's not that daunting once you're airborne they skip five six fixes for the next shortcut and we got a lot of shortcuts and in the end basically ended up flying pretty much a straight line you will have many, many, many handovers. Uh, airspace is just so complex and intersected. Um, and of course, you will hear many, many accents. Uh, whether it's the Danes, whether it's the Icelanders, whether it's the Germans, the Belgians, the Dutch, uh, the Austrians, uh, the Norwegians, uh, every accent is different, but uh, radio discipline is high. Uh, everybody adheres to the language, so it's not a problem. It's just part of the experience. Alison turned out to be a busy international airport, but very friendly. And Lechnes in the Lofoten uh, is actually an uncontrolled airport, no problem to um, fly there. IFR, just like in the US, you can fly to an un uncontrolled airport. And the people were just extremely nice. Don't want to get anybody in trouble, but they even let us drive the car to the plane. Unheard of in Europe, anywhere else. The Lofoten Island themselves are just simply breathtaking. It's one of the most beautiful places, uh, if not the most beautiful place I've ever visited. Been to a lot of places. We did a lot of hikes, experienced stunning vistas, beaches when swimming. The light in the evening is just stunning. Landing in Svalbard uh, or flying to Svalbard requires prior approval from the governor. Again, Svalbard is an independent territory administered by Norway. Um, once you have that approval, the rest is simple. There's hardly any traffic, maybe a couple of scheduled uh, flights from Oslo a day, but you pretty much are gonna be the only one except for some local helicopter traffic. Spitsbergen comes from the German uh, term for sharp edged mountains. You will see in a minute uh, why. Um, it's at latitude 78 north, and it really is an otherworldly place. It is stunningly beautiful. Uh, it started out in mining and today it mainly lives off tourism and a lot of internet companies have satellite antennas there for their satellite downloads. Uh, the main city, uh, Longyearbyen, is really an adventure frontier town like you would expect in Alaska. You can do boating, hiking and exploring all year round. We do most of that. Here's some visuals. This is approaching Lechnes in the Lofoten Island. Um, here is runway 02. Um, you see our commander in the Lofoten. As, uh, here's some pictures from some hikes. We actually went swimming. Uh, it is cold, but it's very nice. Um, I can't say enough about uh, the Lofoten Islands. Here descending into Spitsbergen. Now you know why they're called Sharp Edged Mountains. Uh, glaciers everywhere up there. And our commander in uh, Svalbard. Very nice wildlife walking around, um, the reindeer, arctic fox, seal, birds, and uh, many more. Uh, really a special place. Now, let's talk about getting home. First, we had to head south 
to drop off my sister who uh, continued on commercially. Tromso is not exactly a general aviation friendly airport. The day before they contacted us and said, hey, we don't have any parking space for you, so don't come. Well, in the end said, we have to come, but we just did a quick turnaround and skipped the overnight, planned overnight. <laughs> Turned out they had plenty of space there. Uh, it was just some construction going on. So that gave us an extra day in Reykjavik, uh, visited the Pearl and Nature Museum, which I can highly recommend. And we planned it such that uh, we spent Sunday in Narsasarak. Narsasarak is actually closed on Sunday. So if you want the airport open, you're going to pay heavily. So we flew in on Saturday, left on Monday. We did a long hike to Igaliku, which is a serene, special, beautiful place across the main uh, fjord here called Eriks Fjord. Again, words can't describe the beauty there. As you head towards uh, Goose Bay, of course, can pass again, call two to 48 hours in advance, and then make arrangements with U.S. Customs. We picked Grand Rapids, Michigan as our port of entry. And uh, it's kind of a little uh, bad surprise on arrival at our home airport, the FAA, for reasons that are left for another video, suspended all IFR approaches at our home airport. Thankfully, we had uh, marginal VFR and uh, could uh, land after this journey. Leave you with some visuals from Reykjavik. This is the, the famous uh, museum. Uh, we found a fellow commander, uh, it's November registered, but actually based in Belgium, in Reykjavik. And then, of course, Greenland, uh, North Asterik was again the star of the trip home. We did the visual, sometimes called the fjord approach, um, just to enjoy the stunning beauty of the place. Um, back in Narsasarak, and uh, here's a picture from our hike, and uh, one of the gazillion icebergs in the fjord. Let me summarize with the highlights. It was a true joy to prepare this trip. Um, you know, once you get... Um, more advanced in age, learning something new is always uh, a great joy. Um, it's also nice to join a small community that is uh, not open to a lot of people or transparent that, that are involved in ferry flying. Um, Narsasarak and Greenland was just fabulous. We had great weather both times. I've heard plenty of stories how terrible it can be in bad weather, but thankfully we did not experience that. And I talked about this experience of clouds blending with glaciers. Innsbruck for us, of course, was very sentimental. And the soaring in Innsbruck was fabulous. Um, it allowed us to fly down memory lane. Again, the Lofoten Islands are just stunningly beautiful. Uh, I can only highly recommend it. It's a far away. And flying is the best way to get there, but once you're there, it's it's fantastic. Svalbard is a true frontier down, and it has the feeling that you reach the end of the world. I think it's the most northern town in the world and uh, the most northern airport in the world you can uh, get to. Greenland for sure will see us again. It is close to, in relative terms, the U.S. They're actually ex expanding two runways on the western side uh, in Nuuk and another one. Uh, so, um, you have to go there in the winter for the northern lights, um, and it's also at the right latitude for the northern lights. Svalbard is too far north for northern lights, so certainly Greenland will see us again. And then our trusty, our trusted turbo commander is really turned out to be an incredible and relatively economical, reliable travel platform. As you know that the range exceeds most of all of the very light jets and some of the uh, light jets. Um, it allows you to often uh, skip a fuel stop, so your end, uh, block time is comparable. So I can't say enough good things about the Turbo Commander. I think it's a platform that has been overlooked um, in today's general aviation. The Garrett engines or Honeywell turbines are extremely economical. You go along with sipping 65 gallons an hour for, on, for both engines. So it's just a great platform. Uh, I will put all of these uh, links in the description below. And with that, I thank you for following along about our journey exploring the North Atlantic. Thank you.